He has also begun upgrading Warsats with new capabilities of his own invention, and I'm not entirely sure what those abilities are. It's exactly the goal we were striving towards, this level of autonomous control, and I know I should be celebrating. My work here is done, but it occurs to me that there's one existential concept I never taught Rasputin. Trust. And even if he trusts us, are we 100% certain we can trust him? Welcome back Guardians. Today we are combining all the new lore that the Warmind DLC brings to piece together the origin story of Rasputin. Whilst Clover's Bray no doubt played a part in Rasputin's creation, Rasputin's origin and initial code may lie elsewhere. Furthermore, Rasputin's original creator may have murdered another scientist to ensure his original code lived on. As usual, the artwork seen at the beginning of this video was provided by Gamma Trap and paid for with your kind donations over on Patreon. All donations go towards paying for the artwork. This is Mylan Games, and I hope you enjoy this latest Destiny 2 lore episode. There are three main sources of information to uncover the origins of Rasputin. The first is information from the scannable Clovis Bray terminals, narrated by the concierge AI. The second is Anna Bray's diary entries obtained from the sleeper nodes. And the third are journal entries relating to Ares 1. Yes, the Ares 1 mission led by Jacob Hardy to make first contact with the traveler on Mars. Starting with the Concierge AI, these scannables focus heavily on Clovis Bray's input for developing Rasputin's moral protocols, and for his overall purpose of predicting threats to humanity and eliminating them. Have a listen. The engineers of Clovis Bray conceived a solution during the development of our Warmind project. By relegating ethical decision making to a black box morality system, the war mind instruments its own proprietary virtue quantifiers incomprehensible to even its own creators. Rasputin determines morality on its own terms, and by design, we are blind to that process in order to preserve its objectivity. In the past, one could create a neural network able to identify a feline or canine when given images of these animals, but it would never be able to find a useful application for that knowledge on its own. The approach with Rasputin was to create a nested neural network that could not only detect patterns on a small scale, but recursively find patterns among all of its data. The end goal for this machine is for it to see things in a way that humans cannot and thus predict and eliminate threats before we know of them. The concierge AI is quick to point out that by giving Rasputin a black box morality system, which I assume means that the internal processes are hidden from its creators, it allows Rasputin to assess dangers and make decisions that humans cannot. Whilst the concierge AI introduces this idea of Rasputin's moral protocol, it is really Anna Bray's diary entries that provides the real details to how Rasputin developed these protocols. The very first diary entry reads, You can lead a machine to language, but you can't make it think. Well, you can't, but I can. My name is Anna Bray. The diary entries shows Anna Bray's process for teaching Rasputin. Essentially, rather than specifically coding information into Rasputin, Anna chooses to develop Rasputin through exposure and absorption of information, like a child. Hence why one of the entries is called Machine Child. Transcript 1 of her diary entry reads, Rasputin's designers made a mistake that exasperates me. They brought in linguists and neurobiologists, then tried to convert their expertise into rules for Rasputin to follow. Way to face plant, people. No set of concrete data can ever wrangle a human language. It's not math. Language is mutable, adaptable. For every rule obeyed, there's a rule broken. Babies don't learn their native tongue through rules. They learn it through exposure, absorption. 
and until I roll up my sleeves and get to work, Rasputin is mankind's most expensive baby. So Anna teaches Rasputin by providing access to all these different pieces of information, so he can learn like a child. She would go on to give Rasputin great works of philosophy, military history, and even art, including comedies. Anna Bray's diary continues and documents improvement using this method in Rasputin's ability to make decisions. With transcript 3 reading, You heard me. Rasputin has developed intuition. I wish he could celebrate with me. The entries continue and the final journal entry for Anna Bray that we have access to ends with this. I think he's ready to go online. I guess I saw this coming, but it was still a blow. I arrived in the lab this afternoon to discover that Rasputin has discarded my communication protocols. He's replaced them with a system-wide program that he himself designed. His voice is unlike anything that has ever existed. It is both haunting and lovely. It is also terrifyingly efficient. He's also begun upgrading war sats with new capabilities of his own invention, and I'm not entirely sure what those abilities are. It's exactly the goal we were striving towards, this level of autonomous control, and I know I should be celebrating. My work here is done, but it occurs to me that there's one existential concept I never taught Rasputin. Trust. And even if he trusts us, are we 100% certain we can trust him? Between the information in the concierge AI terminals and Anna Bray's diaries, we can be pretty confident that Clovis Bray played a very big role in developing the moral protocols. However, that does not mean that they created Rasputin itself. In fact, you may have already noticed something very specific that Anna Bray said in her diary. Rasputin's designers made a mistake that exasperates me. This clearly shows that Anna Bray didn't originally make Rasputin, but rather just modified it, helped it develop its moral protocols. Someone else was involved with the initial creation. This is where I believe Ares 1 is involved. Commander Jacob Hardy led a team who first made contact with the Traveller on Mars. The team included Dean Chow, Evie Kalumet, and Dr. Mihalova. Dr. Mihalova was in charge of developing the AI to help run the mission. Ares 1 original code name was also called Catamaran. The law tab for Mihalova's instruments describes her perspective on what an AI should be. It reads, AI can be of help in more than logistics. It can make people safe. I feel certain that this Moon X is an intelligence, perhaps an AI, and I don't feel safe with it at all. Do you? But bear this in mind. For our own AI to serve us, it will need secrets too. For AI to serve humanity, we must feel comfortable, and for us to feel comfortable, we must never know the truth. That we have a servant who would surpass us if ever it desired. Of course it won't because we control it, but we should not doubt that it is a necessary subterfuge nonetheless. As you can see, Mihalova's perspective on AI is already very similar to what Anna Bray would develop. This black box morality system allowing Rasputin to keep secrets from its creators. Mihalova is recruited to the Ares 1 team quite suddenly and pulled from her university work without her knowledge and requested to design the AI for the mission to intercept the Traveller on Mars. The law tab for Mihalova's choice is a conversation between her and her boss at the university. It reads, M. I will not sit. What's happening? Have I been terminated? What are you people? P. For heaven's sake, no. Your equipment is safe, it's been moved, you've been chosen to design the AI for the catamaran mission. M. I'm in the middle of my research here. P. Well, now you're going to continue it there, and look, you'll be a household name. M. I don't have any interest in that. P. Ah, but they're interested in you. Hang on. M. What? P. I've just sent you your itinerary. You're on a flight, Dr. Mihalova, this afternoon. You're going to meet your computers at Central Command in Florida. Look at it this way. You'll get some sun. 
Whilst reluctant to join the team, Mihailova does help design the AI for Ares 1. During the process, she becomes very defensive of her work and refuses to share the information with her teammates, specifically Evie. The law tab for Mihailova's triumph reads, the situation with E becomes increasingly tenuous. She insists she needs access to all the AI code for her gravity well measurements, which I find highly unlikely. It's simply not necessary and I've given her all the subroutine code that she could possibly need. But she wants it all. It's absurd. What would she make of the R subsystems if she saw them? R. That's what I've codenamed the deepest core of the experimental AI at the heart of the new ship. And he's doing very well, now writing his own code, off the charts well. Would E even understand? Likely should go running to Hardy, show him some of the odder items where R has written some of his own code and seems to be, how can I put it, passing judgement on us, like a little hidden critic. No. The AI must be protected so that he can function best in the limited way we need. Not sure how to keep her away, but giving her access could be catastrophic. Yes, the deepest core of the AI that Mihailova is developing for the ship to pilot Ares 1, or at least to help pilot Ares 1, to make contact with the Traveller is codenamed R. Despite Mihailova's reluctance to share the code, Chow gives access to Evie anyway. Three days before Ares 1 is set to launch for Mars, Evie reviews the AI code and approaches Mihailova saying that she is concerned for the AI system, claiming that it has errors. The errors that Evie commented on was almost like the AI had personality. For example, Evie commented on the AI making assessments of the team and even commenting on Chow's snoring. The law tab reads, Evie. Listen, I wanted to talk to you alone. M. Alright. E. Have you read some of these outputs? I think there are some serious errors here. M. Don't be absurd. E. You've got it. You've got... It's got these code caches, and it's... M. It's creating assessments of us, of the project, of the crew. It even... It commented on Charles snoring when he was asleep. Look here. M. Did you print that out? E. Of course. M. Okay, alright. So what do you propose? E. Bringing it to Hardy. M. Uh, of course. E. What's that supposed to mean? M. I mean, look, um, you're right. It must be an error. This is all embarrassing. Let me see if I can fix it. Give me a day. E. We don't have a day. M. 12 hours then. Let me try to locate the problem. And if I can't, of course we'll take it to the whole team. E. Are you certain you can? M. Oh. I have to. 12 hours. By then, I swear, we'll have it all squared away. Mihailova promises to fix the errors within 12 hours, but you've probably already worked out by now that these are not errors. This is the AI that Mihailova intended to make a system that writes its own code. Here is where it gets even more interesting. After Mihailova is confronted by Evie about the AI, after Mihailova is given a deadline to review the errors, otherwise it would be escalated to Hardy, Evie is killed in a freak accident in their clubhouse. The clubhouse is just the area where they had been housed prior to launch. Hardy's control law tab reads, we're 24 hours late. I've never seen the crew in such a crappy mood. It was so stupid. An electrical fire in a clubhouse stairwell. One minute Evie's putting some final touches on her calculations and was headed off to do a telecast about the effect of flash erosion on coastal tides. And the next, we didn't even notice she was gone. We learn about cascading events, how catastrophe comes from one thing stacking onto another. A fried electrical system, a weak sprinkler, smoke, no one else paying attention, a spill in the stairwell, making the steps slippery. Our safe cocoon became a death trap. A coincidence? Or did Mihailova go to the ultimate extreme to protect her AI code, killing Evie so that the AI would remain untouched? Let me remind you of Mihailova's 
last words to Evie. Let me try to locate the problem. And, oh, I have to. Twelve hours. By then I swear we'll have it all squared away. In the mind of Mihalova, the problem was not the code, the problem was Evie digging around in her work. Mihalova is interviewed years later after the mission, and the interview seemed to be conducted by Old Russia Agency of Technology and Science. When asked about her work for Ares 1 and whether the AI she developed helped run the mission, Mihalova responded with this. It was good work. Most of the AI code I started there didn't really get used for the mission, but it came in handy. I mean, where do you think? Before finishing her sentence, the document ends. If I were to guess at Mihalova's next words, it would have been, I mean, where do you think Rasputin was born? The AI designed to assist Ares-1 with their mission to contact the Traveller was created by Mihalova. The deepest part of its core was codenamed R, and I believe this was the birthplace of Rasputin. We do not know how Clovis Bray got hold of this core, of this technology, but we know that they took it and they continued Mihalova's work, her philosophy of developing an AI with secrets, a black box morality system, an AI that we no longer understand or control. That concludes this latest Destiny 2 lore episode. If you'd like to support the channel and cannot think of a comment, you can leave the phrase black box to represent all the aspects of Rasputin which are hidden to us. As usual, it has been a pleasure. This is Marlon Games. Peace.